In the last presentation, we looked a little bit at AI application development and how we had to start thinking about how we build applications that leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in this particular presentation, we're going to look a little bit further at some of those questions and, and suggest some approaches on how we might think about building an application that leverages artificial intelligence or machine learning. So there are a couple of different models that we can use to approach machine learning. Uh, classification is common when we are looking at like fraud detection applications. You know, is there is there um, you know some type of uh, credit card company or bank who is looking at transactions and trying to detect fraud? So if you think about that, you might have a whole lot of transactions, and you may want to be classifying them into legitimate transactions for this user or fraudulent transactions for this user, and that might require you to really think about different profiles of users and how those users are similar, and think about how you would as assemble the data necessary to identify. What what a user's purchase patterns are. Spam filters are similar. You know, you might have a whole lot of messages that are marked as legitimate, and then you may have a whole lot of messages that are marked as spam filters or spam. And then you also have to think about the exceptions. You know, where do you apply the uh, the the exceptions of these? If someone marks the sender as safe, do you, do you even put it through a spam filter? Uh, regression applications. You know, so like credit scores. You know, scoring someone's credit uh, or you know. Um, classifying somebody into different credit uh, areas or credit ratings uh, predicting housing scores can be a good, or housing prices can be an application of regression you might have to think about the anomalies and how you handle those anomalies um, you know an interesting question is if you have something that doesn't really fit the data or doesn't fit a pattern or you know is maybe out of the range of what you're expecting do you even try to do a prediction or do you just stop everything at that point uh, knowledge extraction, so pulling information from text or from images, and you know a lot of times what you might want to do is you might have multiple models, you know some that are doing things like knowledge extraction and some that are doing things to actually classify what you're pulling out of that. And then the big thing uh, in the last couple of years has been generative mo models, which a couple of years ago was not that exciting of a space or maybe not that controversial of a space definitely not as notable as it is today uh, but with the rise of uh, app of, of ml models like uh, chat gpt uh, i think that you're seeing a lot of these generative models becoming much more prevalent in at least in the media um, so if we want to evaluate machine learning for our application, the first thing that we should really be thinking about is what's the question we're trying to answer? Like, What is the business objective uh, for our application? Because sometimes dwelling on this question may lead you to the conclusion that machine learning is necessary and that we can't do it effectively as, as human beings. But it might also lead you to the conclusion that machine learning is actually not the right approach for this particular application. Uh, you know, so I think a good way to practice this is, you know, if you look at your problem as a human, um, how do you solve it? You know, like as a human being, how do you solve this particular problem? What's your approach? You know, do you look at the data? Do you identify trends? If it's simple as just, you know, looking at one or two inputs, this is probably something that rules and heuristics can actually uh, address as opposed to a machine learning model. Uh, a lot of times machine learning is sort of the, the, the hammer that pounds all nails. Uh, and I think that if you if you wield machine learning in that way, everything looks like a nail. Um, sometimes though, the, the solution to your problem or how you solve your problem is much more cost effective and straightforward to just build a, a simple, uh, simple set of if else statements or a simple algorithm that can evaluate your inputs and actually give you the output you expect. Um, maybe it's Maybe it's less probabilistic, or maybe uh, maybe the predictions aren't as good. But it's good to think about the process of how you might solve this problem. Um, you know, rules and heuristics can always be uh, a good, uh, well, can't always be, but often are a good substitute for a machine learning model. It's also good to think about your product versus your machine learning model. What does the model do and what does your product do? And I think that this is an important factor when you're considering uh, the separation between what your application is and what your model is, because often people conflate this you know they treat everything as if it is the, the job of the model and a lot of times simple things can be done by your product you know i think that machine learning um you know training is not free uh you know it, it can at least consumes compute resources uh energy things like that uh you know making predictions is not free so sometimes doing things in your product might be a better way to go and a good way to think about this is you know if you have hundreds of inputs, uh, you know, you can build a, a model that might accept hundreds of inputs, but maybe there aren't that many that are very valuable for what you're doing in machine learning. So I think it's a, a good way to think about, you know, what do we actually want to train the model on and what can be handled by our product? Maybe the product can pre-compute some, some uh, values. So I think that's a, that's a good way to, to kind of isolate these two different areas. Um, you want to evaluate the feasibility of your machine learning, and that involves a whole lot of questions like, 
do I have data? Can I generate data? What's the cost of building a data set here? Uh, what's the cost of training? How often do we need to retrain? Um, is this going to be a practical approach for solving the problem ahead of us? Uh, a lot of times, too, you have to choose what your approach is. We looked at some of those approaches on the previous slide. There are a lot of machine learning approaches out there, but maybe even think about more than one approach. Maybe you need multiple approaches to make this work effectively. Uh, but I think that another good way to get started is to start small. Build something that maybe is not perfect, maybe doesn't solve all of your problems, but see if it solves enough of your problems to be interesting. Because sometimes you might find that you know you might not be able to get to a model that, that solves the problem. Uh, sometimes there are just too many variables or too much complexity or you just don't have access to all of the necessary inputs to build an effective machine learning model. So starting small can help you to start answer, answering and evaluating some of those questions. The next thing you have to do once you've, if you've decided, yeah, let's let's move forward on this, is find data. Uh, is labeled data available? Do we have data somewhere? Is, it, is there an easy way to, to source data? Um, for certain things, you know, there's already a lot of, like if you're doing image classification, you might be able to find images very effectively and you might be able to classify those very effectively from a human labeling standpoint. Uh, but can you efficiently label all data? Do you have the outputs that you are looking to predict? Um, do you have these? Do you have this information? Sometimes in tabular data, you have a bunch of uh, a bunch of your inputs, but maybe you don't have the output. So can you even build a, an effective supervised learning model uh, based on the data you have? Maybe you have unlabeled data, but then there's a the process of actually labeling that, and that becomes very complicated because what do you do when your humans are labeling things incorrectly? How does that affect your machine learning model? Uh, you know how. Um, how do we verify that we're getting the right predictions, or how do we verify that we're getting the right uh, data as inputs? How do you how do you make sure that you know three people all believe the same thing? Maybe you have to do a you have to perform labeling by multiple people, and you know actually investigate where those people's uh, labels disagree. Now there are a lot of ways to label your data nowadays. This is 2023 and you can use a lot of different services. Uh, you know, just scale this out. You've got a uh, crowd compute, you know, mechanical Turk. There's a lot of different capabilities for actually getting other people to label your data, but you do have to build and curate and manage this data set. Uh, the other question is, um, is the question that we're trying to solve even the right question? It may be that you start exploring data and you start investigating. And the thing that you need to do is not even the right thing you know it may be that you know you have to adjust the parameters of your question or you have to adjust how you're approaching your problem in order for this to make sense sometimes you start off thinking oh we're going to build a model that's going to you know look at images and predict this but maybe that's actually not the problem you need to solve especially when you're thinking in the context of your application so uh, starting simple, what's the simplest model or prediction that supports your application? If there's something your application can't do, what's the easiest way to solve that problem? What's the most adequate way that you can plug machine learning into your into your application that will help your application? Uh, and then you have to verify your results. We looked at that very briefly earlier when we built an image classification model. We gave it a few different inputs, but that's probably not enough. You know, there's a lot of different uh, anomalies there. You know, like I think when, you know, just in the example of dogs and lizards, a lot of those lizards are going to be photographed in sandy locations and a lot of those dogs are going to be photographed in grassy locations. So what's the chance that your model is actually predicting whether there's grass or sand in your in your image as opposed to the thing you're actually thinking about? So having those variables, having, you know, thinking about the breadth and the depth of the data that you're using for training as well as for validating and testing, that can really help to build a, a model that's not going to give you unpredictable results later. You know, a lot of times you might find yourself in a, in a sort of tunnel vision where you've got the right model, you've got the right data, you've trained everything, but then when you get it out into the real world and the, the application tries to utilize it, you find that the real world has different inputs or different context and you know the way that, uh, that you accept data into your model Maybe not quite what you thought when you were training and, and evaluating this, you know, in, in a you know testing setting.